experience of him. <laughs> Um, this very powerful experience of, of defending his thesis in front of his grandfather. And um, after the last session, I got a note from, from one of you uh, who was part of that session. And I wanted to read it to start our day today because it was, um, it, was a, it was a helpful reminder to me. So this is from Velma in Tallahassee. And she wrote this. <clears throat> the art of gathering has been a big influence on the in-person music classes I teach. Thank you. And I learned from all of your podcasts and online, online chats. Keep them coming. And I have one suggestion. After watching the Dr. Clint Smith interview yesterday, after he showed the photo of his grandfather watching the dissertation defense, and he read about his what his family had experienced in Mississippi and how all those people brought him to this moment, I had tears in my eyes. I noticed that Dr. Smith also took off his glasses and dabbed his eyes. I needed a moment a short pause to take a breath and feel what he was feeling and to be together apart. I try to remember to watch my singers to see who is crying a little after a song. I might softly say, let's take a breath. Even a few seconds can honor what has been shared and felt in a unique moment. As the teacher or host, we're usually thinking about moving things along and what's next, etc. And yet sometimes we all need a few seconds to be quiet and simply breathe with each other. So I wanted to thank Velma for the reminder. Um, as a facilitator of in-person gatherings, a lot of my instincts are to watch and to read the room, and I can't actually see you all. And so I'm going to try today to do some of the experiments and, and the, the techniques that I use if I were, if we were 250 people in a room together. Um, and thank you, Velma, to, for the reminder to be, for us to be together apart as we have these conversations. And so with that, I wanna invite you to actually close your eyes for a second and take a couple of deep breaths and just sit into your chair or wherever you are at home and think back to the moment in which you were at a wedding. It could be your, your own or somebody else's but think back to a moment in which you were at a wedding and you felt, this is why we marry with our community. And think back to one moment, one memory that made you feel fully a part of a community at a wedding. And when the moment comes to mind, I'm gonna invite you to actually put it into the chat um, to, for everybody to see it. You're gonna to have to click to everybody, not just to the organizers. And I'm just gonna invite you to, to type in a moment from a wedding that made you feel fully alive. I see a lot of dancing in this list. Um, <laughs> a lot of dancing. So exchanging vows with our guests, group photo in front of the church, the look on the bride and groom's faces after their first kiss, when we all toasted my dad at my sister's wedding, everyone getting under the chuppah, passing the bride and groom's rings around the room before they exchanged them, during a bumpy school ride with a brother-in-laws and the wife bonding, at the end of the night, dancing, toasting, clapping, laughing, doing the Cupid shuffle, everyone dancing around the bride and groom. I love this. So with that, I want to, as these memories are flooding through, I wanna introduce and welcome Elaine Welteroth. Um, she needs no introduction, but Elaine is a journalist. She's a best-selling author. Um, she is the first editor-in-chief, she's the former editor-in-chief of Vogue, Mag of Teen Vogue and was, is now, I guess, the second African-American to hold that position and the second youngest woman and person to hold that position. She's a friend of mine. She's a personal role model. When I think about who I want to talk to to process what's happening in the world, Elaine is somebody I turn to. And she's also a bride who just went through the experience of figuring out how to have a wedding when her original plans were upended. And um, welcome, Elaine. Thank you for joining us. 
Welcome, everyone. Hi, Priya. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Con congratulations. Thank you. Woo, we pulled <laughs> off the impossible. So Thank Elaine you. just got married on Sunday. And um, before we hear about how you and Jonathan pull this off, I want to take, tell, tell me first just a little bit about um, your love story. Like, who, who did you marry? How did you meet? Um, how did you get to a point where you were engaged? <sighs> okay, well, so Jonathan and I met each other when we were 12 years old. We grew up in the same church back home in Northern California. Our mothers, um, to this day, stand next to each other in the church choir. It's a whole <laughs> cornball love story. We can't even- The whole it. thing. <laughs> How is this real? Um, and he was kind of like this big, I thought he was like a big nerd with these big glasses, um, but I always thought, God, he's, he's, he has the nicest smile. He is the kind, he seems really kind, but we didn't really know each other. Um, as preteens or teenagers, we would just see each other every Sunday at church and kind of wave and smile. Um, but we went to different schools and, um, you know, I would come back home. When we both went off to college, we'd come home to church on Sundays for holidays and see each other there and catch up a little bit. But it really wasn't until a, about um, six and a half years ago he, when he um, came to New York to interview for some jobs that he messaged me on Facebook and asked if I wanted to get together for drinks because he was going to be in town. And um, we always laugh that he signed off that message on Facebook, best, Jonathan. It was like very <laughs> professional. And I was like fresh out of a breakup, didn't have anything be better to do than just, you know, meet up with that one guy from church. You know, that's pretty much all he was to me at the time. And then it was one of those magical New York nights where it's like you meet up for drinks and you expect to be home in bed by like nine. And instead drinks turn to dinner, dinner turned to dessert, dessert turned to you want to go to this party. It's like, oh yeah, actually I was already going to go to that party. Cool. Let's go together to the, you know, karaoke. And it was just one of those just never ending, super adventurous, fun nights. And and uh, within uh, two months, he, had, he, he, well, he got the job that he came to interview for. And within two months, he moved to New York. And my mom came to town it, that March for her birthday. And we were going to make this big feast for all my friends in New York for her to meet them. And she goes, Elaine, you're going to invite Sheila's son over now, aren't you? And I go, no, mom. Like, I, and she's like, you better invite him over here. I'm not going to have his mother uh, jamming me up at the choir stand telling me I didn't feed her baby. Have him over. And so I invited him over. And I'm telling you, that was the night it all began. And I, oh, and my mom, let her tell it. It was all her. She was like, I'm the Cupid in this story. I knew what I was doing by telling you to invite him over. She's like, you don't think me and his mom have been, haven't been praying for this to happen since you, 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 you have this little preteen. She's like, we wear this in we prayed this into existence. So it, the rest is history. I like to say, I like to think it was my fried chicken that night that got him, you know, it was the first and last time I ever made um, him a full <laughs> proper dinner, but um, no, since, that's amazing. Until, the quarantine, until the quarantine, that's another story. Um, and yeah, we've been together ever since that was like six and a half, six, six or and a half years ago. And then we, we've been engaged for three and a half years. It's been a long engagement. We were ready so you had, for, for many reasons. I did not. And, and so, um, you know, pre-COVID, I met with you and Jonathan planning this wedding that um, as part of actually, you know, behind the scenes, an earlier podcast on gathering before Corona hit. Um, yeah. And we sat down and at the time, I remember you saying, we are getting mar married on Mother's Day 2020. Yes. 5, 10, 20. Our mothers yes. got us together. We're going to do this in our hometown, and um, and you were planning an in-person wedding with all of the people in your life, and then Corona hit. And tell us a little bit about the process of realizing, like, that what you had planned may not actually happen. Yeah, yeah, it all happened really fast. So I had just gotten back from my bachelorette retreat, as I called it, in. Um, <laughs> It actually language matters. 
inspired by my friend Priya Parker, what you call an event is, you know, is very, very important. So I, I was very clear. It was not a bachelorette party. It was a bachelorette retreat. And um, we, I, I landed on March 9th back in New York. And I swear to you, that felt like the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. it, every single day, um, the, the crisis was accelerating. And he actually had planned a bachelor party in Mexico for the following weekend or, the, or maybe the, the one after that. And day by day, one per, another one of his guests would just say, hey, I can't, I, I can't risk it. I'm not comfortable going. So it became clear he, he had to call that off. And then at that point, I think that's when the waves of denial started to hit because it became more and more evident that we would have to start looking at whether or not we could really even do this wedding anymore. Um, yeah. The way we had planned it, you know, and as you said, we plan to do this um, you know, on Mother's Day as a tribute to our moms on a Sunday, because that's the day we met. That's the day we saw each other every day of our lives growing mm -hmm. up. You know, we wanted to do this on a 5, 10, 20, because though that there was such significance in, in the combination of those numbers that only come around, that only come together once in a lifetime. You know, we had, I'm a storyteller, I'm an editor, like these, <laughs> all of these little things, they just made totally. so much sense. They just meant so much. And so, for, so, so, you know, people started calling and asking, what are you going to do? Are you going to cancel the wedding? And I just hate the word cancel. Like it's, it's like the word, no, I, I don't understand. I don't comprehend no very well. I'm always, <laughs> like, there's always a way, you know? And, um, when there is a will, there's a way that's how, that's how I operate. And so I rejected the word cancel. I, I knew we might have to postpone, but I really postponed announcing the postponement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's just really wait this out and see. And at first it felt like, oh, of course by May 10th, this will be blown over. There's no way. And then as we all saw, um, you know, what we thought was impossible became the reality. And so we decided, we gave ourselves a deadline, which was April 1st, to, to make a decision and to send an announcement. And um, before that April 1st deadline, I... I real I had to recognize um, what was making me sad about this. Mm -hmm. Like really, what what's the th what is you know there is always layers, and I wanted to get to the root of why I'm really why am I sad? Um, and I was like, and yeah, I recognized it really what pained me more than missing out on this big you know moment that I had that we had planned together. The was missing out on our day like this date I didn't want to give up the date I, I I could I could and so I just walked into his office where he was working and I just opened the door and I said Jonathan I am marrying you on 5 10 20 even it have if it has to be right here on our stoop in Brooklyn even if I'm in my sweats I am marrying you on 5 10 20 come hell or high water and he just looked at me and smiled and it was like, we were just in instant agreement about that. And then the weight lifted, the sadness lifted. And I felt like I still got, I got the thing that mattered the most. Um, mm. And, and, you know, the party could wait. I, but I really, it took us three and a half years to get to this place of readiness in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to celebrate that, you know, and I, and I didn't want to delay it any longer. And so then I, I, and I think the lesson there was for us, it was sort of identifying um, our why, which was celebrating our readiness to make this commitment to each other, and then what the true priority was. And for mm -hmm. us, it was saving our date. Mm -hmm. And from there, we could start um, dreaming up the how. how. The I how. Have. Yeah. You put the why in front of the how. Yeah. So let me pause you for a second. I'm seeing in the chat that a lot of people are really um, relating and appreciating what you're saying. I know there are a lot of a number of brides and um, and some grooms on the call who have also saved their date, but also have changed their date. And part of I think um, I saw an interesting article. I don't know if she's on the call or not. That came out um, this week on Medium. It's called "Out with the O O W D In with the 
NWD, which basically means out with the old wedding date, in with the new wedding date by Carla Combs. And it's, uh, we'll, send it, we'll share it with you all afterwards, but it was this beautiful piece by a woman who professionally helps um, life cycle events. And she says, for those, if, if you can't keep your date, which you did, and I think part of your realization that the date was much more than a date, the date was the symbol and, a, and almost a contract of the, of, the, of, the, of the crossing of your union, right? That, that, that it felt, it felt, it didn't feel right somehow to actually change the date. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's somebody I saw in the chat also named Danny, who we actually spoke with also for the, with the podcast. Um, and she is, she comes from a Jewish tradition that it's actually um, like in her, at least as it was told to her by her aunt, forbidden to change the date, like come hell or high water, it's bad luck to change your date because the whole thing is like nothing should get in the way of this union. Um, and, and I think part of what people are really thinking about right now is A, do you save the date? And B, if you change the date, part of what um, Combers is, is saying is it's still really important to actually mark that date through a ritual, through a ritual of grieving and loss, like uh, of, what, of, what you, of the feelings that you have, of, of pain, of, of wishing, of, of what you are not actually experiencing, of connecting with your partner, um, she gives examples of, of small rituals that you can do to remind each other why, um, you know, it's kind of scary to change a wedding date, right? It, 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 does it bring up other stuff? Like, are, are, we changing, are we changing something else besides the date? And so part of the, um, if you are changing it to acknowledge and let go the feelings of grief and loss and to feel supported with, with each other. Um, and she talks about writing letters, love, exchange love letters and tell each other all the reasons why you wouldn't wanna be quarantined with anyone else. Um, and to, to actually acknowledge the transition and still mark it, even if you're changing the date. So I just wanted to say that for those of you who are on, um, who are with us in the community, that this relationship, like Elaine mentioned this earlier, so part of a gathering is this future promise of the psychological event that you are expecting, that you are not just planning for, but preparing yourself for, that your community is preparing itself for. And then all of a sudden, if it's changed, that change needs to be managed. It needs to be honored. It needs to be held and transitioned and not just skipped over um, because it's not just a changing of a date. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. That actually reminds me when I sent out the announcement, when we sent out the announcement um, of, that we would be postponing our formal wedding, we also included a save, uh, you know, a, a reminder to save the date still because we were going to do a virtual stoop wedding right here in Brooklyn and we were inviting everyone to participate in that and to stay tuned for more details. And so what, what it was like this this moment, I think everyone was bracing themselves for the announcement that we were postponing, but what, 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 and then when the email came and I think what was, you know, they were expecting to be a sad email became kind of like this, oh, this joyous email, like, oh, we're, they're still celebrating. That is so cool. Amazing. And, and so we got a lot of love um, from people. And, and I think people felt a lot of hope that we, you know, that we still were pushing ahead. And, and, you know, one of the things that inspired this whole concept was just seeing online this meme that said, love cannot be canceled. Love will not be canceled. Mm -hmm. That resonated with me so deeply. And I, it, it was just sitting in my spirit. And I was just like that day when I woke up and I, I was just like, love cannot be canceled. I'm not giving up my date. I'm saving <laughs> my date. And, and the beauty of, of like going through that process of like, okay, you know, identifying what is really the priority here and, and then, and then agreeing, like, we're going to move forward and making this happen somehow is like, it opened up my imagination all over again. And the creativity just started flowing, like ideas started flowing. I opened up my Google doc spreadsheet went that like that morning when I told Jonathan we're still doing it and he agreed and I just like had all these ideas of how we could do it and I had visions of, of of seeing my family my closest family and friends like still seeing their faces but on iPhone screens mm -hmm. and I imagined them like 
being around the, the stoop, I, I imagine transforming the stoop into an altar with flowers and lights and candles. And again, having these faces of all the people I would want to see um, while I'm walking down the aisle and making this commitment still there and being a part of the moment in an intimate way. Um, and it just really, honestly, it ignited my creativity even more than the traditional wedding had because we are an untraditional couple in a lot of ways. I'm an unconventional kind of bride. And I really was in my own ways rejecting the norms of the traditional wedding um, ceremony. And I wanted from the beginning, my friends and family reminded me that I had been saying from the beginning, I don't want it, I, I want to do it our way. I want it to be unique. I don't want it to be like every other wedding you've all been to. I want it to feel like us. So all these things I put into the universe, I realized like, Okay, this is exactly what I asked for. <laughs> Not exactly the way I imagined it, but you know, I, I, I realized in some ways this really gave us the opportunity to do it our way and, mm -hmm. and to throw out some of those old traditional, old traditions. Um, and it, we, and I, I remember saying, I want to create our own tradition. I want to create our own wedding tradition that we can share with our children one day. Um, and so here we, here we have it. We, we did, we leaned into the planning. We became a team. Um, and we did it all ourselves between the two of us and our friends and, and community. I mean, everyone stepped up to the plate and contributed, whether it was jumping into DJ or, you know, driving by on a bike and dropping off some white clothes. Cause I had a mandatory all white attire um, memo for everyone on zoom or and from, anyone from the can. waist up right from the waist up on zoom and someone <laughs> it was so funny on the at the zoom wedding someone said in the comments they go wow this wedding went from black tie to pants optional <laughs> that's, so true. that's amazing um, but yeah, I want to pause you had for a second dropping clothes by for us which is really sweet you know, you, you said, I want, to, I want to be able to create our own traditions. And I think, you know, I think a lot about where do traditions come from in gatherings? And so much of the gatherings, whether it's a wedding or whether it's a, you know, conference, the parts that make our eyes glaze over are actually traditions that no longer make sense and are on autopilot. Mm. And yet at one point, like really, really mattered right? We're created for a reason for a specific community. And, and then, and then generations repeat it over and over again, not actually knowing what a barn, barn raising is, right? Or what a, like all these words that we use, we don't know what a Tupperware party actually means, right? Or what a coffee clutch originally came from. And I, and I, as I listen to you, and I, and I want to invite you to talk a little bit about how you ended up actually hosting the stoop wedding, um, which I was, which I loved to witness as a Zoom guest. Um, I, I'm, you know, right now we're in a moment where we're facing constraints that are unprecedented, and people mm -hmm. are being incredibly imaginative about how to work around them. So like chalk circles, six, you know, chalk circles on the stoop outside of your house or outside of your brownstone, six feet apart. I'm making this up, but I could see that if people start doing that around the country for various gatherings in 200 years, weddings that no longer have to, you know, socially distance might have circles of, you know, six feet apart all around a bride and groom and like the meaning we give to six feet that may no longer make sense in that time, but were created by great, 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 great grandma, Elaine and Jonathan yeah. on, the, you know, on, the <laughs> on the day that the pandemic, you know, prevented their wedding. And we still stand in circles of chalk to honor like innovation in the midst of a pandemic. Oh, I love that. Right. But I think I part of the moment right now is like innovation and meaningful ritual come from constraints and real needs. And we are in an abundance of real needs right now. And so, I, you know, as you all are listening, as you're thinking about your own weddings, as you're thinking about your own gatherings, to actually think about how do you organize around this new reality in ways that are still beautiful and meaningful and frankly make people weep. Like, I'm going to turn it back over and share what it was like for your wedding day and what you end up doing. But being on that Zoom call on the other side of it and having Jonathan come in and having you know 150 squares all in white 
and seeing his face and him seeing ours, like, it was so powerful. We were all weeping. And I don't remember being in a church weeping, right, at the beginning of a ceremony. It was amazing. Mm. Oh. Yeah, it's so funny. One of my friends who uh, watched from Geneva, Switzerland, said that it was the most organic wedding they'd ever witnessed, and it was over Zoom. <laughs> and I just like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that, that says so much. Um, yeah, I mean, raw. I think for, for thank you. I mean, who it was raw. I, I was um, somewhere else doing my makeup by myself, watching Jonathan welcome try to get his words out to welcome everyone and i just saw him crying and then i got all choked up and i was like someone help the man he can't get the, get his words out he had a script <laughs> but i just are you okay if i share what that's like for what as a guest please that yeah. moment? so um my husband and i like quickly put on our white like 10 minutes before, and I'm, if you all are on different Zoom gatherings and whether it's like putting on your makeup or putting on a shirt or putting on something, it's like the 10 minutes before you're doing something else chaotic and then you, you quickly get ready. And um, Elaine and Jonathan asked all of the wedding guests to write them a love letter to mail, but to, as a blessing on their, on their, for what we want for their wedding, for their marriage but on the back to write one word that we would put up to, in the camera um, so that everyone could see what is the blessing? What is the one word that we would like? And they were going to do, so we could take a family picture. That was yeah. going to be our family picture. It's Everyone going to be a, fa there, so there's gonna be a family picture. Word. And so the, before the ceremony started, we were invited to join the zoom room at five fifteen, or I can't remember the time. And we all had our letters waiting our back of our envelopes. And Jonathan was going to just come on and kind of logistically do a family zoom photo. Like, and I could see he was like, Hey, Hey, Hey fam. And then, and his face was as big as Elaine's is in your screen or mine right now. And all, and all of a sudden he goes, oh, oh, whoa, oh my goodness. And then we all like are looking at him, you're like, like pigeons, like all oh, <laughs> little ducks in like these tiny little squares and seeing him and, and like he couldn't get his words out and we couldn't get our words out. And he, and he was like, and it was this incredible like calling of the community. It was like, mom and dad and oh my my um, my cousin's here and whoa and 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 inadvertently he began to name who was in the room he like called us into being and it was this opening benediction that was supposed to be the logistics of like <laughs> a you know a family photo that ended up being like a calling in it was beautiful oh i i wish he was here so you he could hear that because he was just like he was so embarrassed that he cried uh, it like, was beautiful. Yeah, it was. That means a lot, Priya. Yeah, the the um, the the you actually inspired us to come up with creative ways to reenact some of those small moments um, that would normally happen naturally in a in a, at a in a wedding environment. Like, how do we recreate that those moments of connection mm -hmm. virtually? So I took that challenge and I gave it to my closest friends in my community, and I said, "What do you guys think? Let's come up with an let's come up with a ritual together." And my, my one of my best friends, my room, my first roommate in New York for five and a half years. I call her my first wife. She <laughs> um, she was in Swiss, She was the one in Switzerland, and she was so sad to not be there. But she came up with that idea mm -hmm. to have everyone come with one word that, that we would, as an offering up to us, as a word of advice, encouragement, love, that we could take into our marriage with us. And it was just a creative way to involve um, people in our different parts of our lives and for them to make connections with each other. Because yes. I know in that moment when everyone held up their word, they were also looking at yes. other people's Completely. words and being like, oh, I wrote that too. Or, oh, I should have written that. Oh, that's good. That's totally. good. I thought no. of writing that, but I was too embarrassed to put it on an envelope for other people yes. to see, right? Yes. So and those, was, those moments, like, happened. you know, the nerd in me, the nerd in me, like sociologically watching the dynamics of 150 people where you can see their name, right? When you're sitting in a church or in a garden, you can't, you don't really know who people are. You don't know context. You can see their name. You're all in this, because of you, we're all wearing the same color. And then the words, some people had 
you know, the same word. So then you create this interesting soci sociological connections. Like we both said joy, right? Or we both said thrilling or all like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they said, you know, great sex or, you know, whatever. it was like, wow, I want to hang out with that person. And so there was that element. And then, and I'm going to invite you to talk about what you actually did, but then the role of the chat. Oh, the like chat in church, It was fascinating. It was like this back end open participatory peanut gallery on every part of the wedding yes. that bonded the guests in a way that you that would be rude in another context yes it was, it was fascinating it's like we have this running transcript of our guests stream of consciousness yes throughout the entire ceremony and yes. it was hysterical yes heartwarming i mean i felt like getting to go back and watch that the next morning made me feel with all the emotion amplified like i oh it was it's inc it's an incredible gift that we actually have that it we would amazing. there's no way you know what people are thinking when at a typical when the, and wedding. i'll just give some color to those who um just to give an example so like when when elaine <clears throat> came down the they they first began it so it was on the stoop in 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 brooklyn um, for those of you who don't live in New York, there's, you know, five steps up in certain brownstones that are all connected and the stoop is kind of the area where a lot of life happens. And now in Corona times, you know, well, at least the first wedding has happened. And um, a flower girl kind of ran past every, so there's 150 of us on Zoom and then there were people that you had guests on the street a also. Social apart. distancing ceremony. Social distancing that ceremony. Very carefully coordinated. I literally, I'm, I just brought my, my social distancing oh, amazing. that I made because I was very, very, I was obsessing over making sure that it was safe, making sure that everyone understood the rules and where to stand so that, um, yeah, just so that everyone was really comfortable and safe. So yes, there was, and we made little, we made this standing chart. We basically transposed this into this, onto the sidewalk with chalk. We wrote everyone's name for where they should stand during the aisle that we turned it we turned a sidewalk into a wedding aisle and it was lined with my friends and we we actually kept them 10 feet apart just for extra safety we provided we provided gloves and um masks we um and then we had a little we had our flower girl who danced down the aisle and was throwing flowers at everyone it was so sweet we had a we had a violinist and a cello player um and yeah we transformed the the altar it, the stoop into an altar where jonathan was waiting for me at the top and we had a gorgeous um bouquet. we had a florist come and arrange flowers the most mm. magnificent arrangement course, honestly i've ever seen they went above and beyond and again like you know this is a time of quarantine where people people who do creative work have not had the opportunity to do create their their to to share their craft with the world and so every every you know vendor that i called on was so enthusiastic about making this special because for them it was also like it was a, it was an opportunity for them to reconnect with their passion and and yeah. and you could tell you could tell with the way that people with everyone showed up operating at like 20 out of 10 you know um and so it's a the relief it's a relief was, to work it's a relief to create it's yes. a relief to and create with purpose within the and connect completely and 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 so you then walked down the aisle you went up what was it like for you when you finally, when you were like standing there in the sidewalk and you see this scene in front of you, this photo, this, this image that you'd sketched actually happening and you began to walk, tell us about that moment. It was really emotional. Um, so each person in line forming the soul train line, so to speak, um, they were holding a FaceTime from someone from far that I love dearly and that couldn't be there. So the first face that I saw was John, I, I saw Jonathan's parents on his sister's phone. And then I saw um, one of my best friends, Ophi in Switzerland on my friend Carly's phone. And that's really when I got me. I mean, and it, I, I, I just immediately started crying. And and I have such a different relationship with each person in that aisle. And so and each, there's, there's a whole love story with, encapsulated with each, you know, and each person that I passed that every time I looked at them, I felt a, like a wave of all of these 
different motions. And so by the end, my friend, there was a, there was a friend of mine who like, we love having a good time together. And she just threw her arms up and, and, and then I threw my arms up. And so it went from like, from like somber to deeply emotional and weepy to then like party. And then I saw Jonathan and, and that's just, and I saw his little tear and I just like ran up to him and jumped on him. And, and then, and then we, and then it really started. And then everyone kind of, um, formed and there's everyone had three formations they had the aisle formation and then they had the ceremony formation lined up in front of the the stoop and then they had their party formation which was a a socially distanced circle in the street and we were going to come down and dance in the center of that so um and yeah I'm just gonna pause you again and just point out like again such interesting new social dynamics so even the 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 realization to hold to not just have everybody equal on a zoom screen for those who can't come but to privilege those closer to the inner circle parents and loved ones and dear ones to think about like part of our every gathering but particularly a wedding is that there are gradations not everyone is equal not everyone should be equal there's a reason you have a smaller rehearsal dinner there's a reason why you have a bachelorette retreat there's a like it's okay it's actually unhealthy for an entire community to all play the same roles that's not the point of a community and yet you have this moment where you had a choice of who do you want to stand in those lines who can be there in person, which are people who can walk from their homes in Brooklyn to yours, but then yes. who do they hold, yes. right? So you're creating this relationship where yes. the steward becomes a digital portal yes. to your parents, Yes. right? That it's at a, at a systemic level. Like it's not that there haven't been weddings before where somebody who's loved is like sitting there on a FaceTime watching an event. But this is now systemic, right? It's really interesting. Yeah, we thought about that really critically. Um, you know, I thought like, who would be a good match for my grandmother? Yeah. <laughs> and and, um, it, and again, to your earlier assignment to me, you, you said figure out creative ways to create those moments of connection that would naturally happen at a wedding um, that will not happen naturally in this type of a wedding unless you are intentional about it. So this was one of those intentional I you know exercises that where where each person that got that front row view um virtually was able to connect with someone who I consider front row in my life. And yeah. they, you know, they now have a relationship, they have a connection. And so hopefully one day when we do have that party, they're gonna be like, you were my FaceTime buddy. Thank you so much for calling yeah. me, you know? And, and, and I had everyone connect with their FaceTime buddy before the wedding as well, just to make sure the connection was working, that they knew the game plan, that they knew what time they were gonna get the phone call. And so that was a really, really sweet part of the wedding. Uh, yeah. So beautiful. And I want to just highlight for everybody else this insight that when we are creating these new virtual ways of being together apart, <clears throat> it's almost like we are all ritual designers now. <laughs> we yeah. are all facilitators now. We are all wedding planners now. And 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 Elaine's detail of you 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 can't just hope that the mingling that would happen in a reception would anyway hope you have to design it. But it yeah. can be designed, right? Mm -hmm. It can be designed in really beautiful, new, novel ways. Um, you had your minister officiate the wedding through Zoom. Yes. Right? And, and what was fascinating about that for me was I could hear in real time through the chat how his words were affecting everybody else in the room, yeah. right? Like when he was saying things like, I can't remember the exact word, but you know, something yeah. like marriage is also difficult. And you know, someone on the chat was like, thank you. I needed to hear that today. Right? He, said, he said, get creative with conflict. Uh, yeah, 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 get that creative. People. Yeah, he said, see, yeah. It, he said, he dropped some gems. And by the way, that pastor was the same pastor that we grew up with. So that, that man, I mean, we've been, he's formed the bedrock for both of our faith, our walks in faith. And we, we grew up with his words, like really informing our value system. Um, you know, I have chills just thinking about that. I mean, how rare is that, that you get, that you, like, I, I feel that Jonathan and I are cut from the same fabric because we came up in the same church under this man's teachings. And, um, it, and so to be able to get married with that same man and his words 
showering oh, us was just so, so special. It really was special. And he had such a good sense of humor at the beginning. You know, what you, what you both pulled off was amazing. And, and, and it was, you know, so Elaine walked up the aisle, up the stoop. They're both standing there. They're grainy, but we can see them. Then, then, the, then, the, then, then the pinned, they had a video of, uh, of, of photos before in the waiting room that we were watching as we were waiting. And then the and then the pinned video changed to the minister and and it was just it was obvious that all of us were holding our breath and saying um there was there was a bride actually who's on this call named julie who said to me the other day we're not just praying for good weather we're praying for good wi-fi yes yes <laughs> there was this moment yes. where we're like what's going on and the and the minister said well if this is what the wedding's like i can only imagine what the marriage is going to be like <laughs> Uh, and it's such a tribute to 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 you both, but also to the creative spirit of how do we deal in this time? Mm -hmm. um, and I know we're, I want to actually now open it up to questions for the last 10 minutes we have. I know, Elaine, we have you for just a few more minutes. Um, before we open up, and I'd, I'd love to actually allow you to give any advice to our community about what you learned and what they can do. Um, and then I'm going to invite Julie, if you're still on the call, to join us for a call in um, to tell us a little bit about a ritual. Julie's a bride who's getting married in a month and did a very interesting opening ritual yesterday with her partner um, that might give you all some inspiration too. So Elaine, what would you, uh, what, how would you advise people thinking about their weddings in this time? I mean, I think um, the main thing, I, I will just reiterate what I said earlier, which is that it's really important to identify what exactly is the priority and to honor that. Um, and I think that what was helpful for us was to create, to have really strong opinions about very few things mm. so, and use those as parameters for the occasion. Mm -hmm. um, and what were your strong opinions? What were your few strong opinions? Everyone has to wear white. Mm -hmm. And no one understood exactly. John was like, does it really matter? And I said, yes, it really matters. And when you look at the pictures and the video and, and just being there, you could see why it was important. Because there was, one thing we didn't get to talk about, Priya, was that there, was, there were the guests I invited. And then there was the entire community that mm -hmm. poured out into the streets that watched from their window, that danced on their stoop, that were dancing on the wrong rooftop, unplanned. Well, we they saw well, this wedding was happening. We heard the music and they came out and people made signs. They brought pots and pans. They, I mean, it was a community oh. event. They were such a huge part of, of what happened, but what, but what it did was having everyone that we invited in white made it very clear. There was a clear demarcation of who our people are and then who the community is Beautiful. um and that was really important i knew that right away i knew that i, I knew that i wanted to, to make the stoop the centerpiece um and that we were going to make that the altar so every you know that was really there's a point of focus there's a point there's a there's focal a physical point. point of focus yeah yes and then i also knew um in the planning process, I got really sad one day because I thought about the fact that I won't, the thing that I'm giving up in addition to all, you know, the big, big plans that we had was that I won't be able to walk down the aisle. I was like, I think I cared about that. I know I'm not a traditional bride, but <laughs> I, I, I'm, I actually, I'm surprised and I'm surprised that I'm sad about having to give up that moment of walking down the aisle. And Jonathan goes, we can still make you an aisle. It could be a soul train aisle. Your people can be the aisle. And I was like, that is the best idea I've ever heard of. <laughs> soul train lines are my favorite thing in the world. I try to make them happen at every party I go to. So, and even work events. So it was this brilliant idea. So, so that was really important to us as well. But then we had to be fluid. So I think it's creating these parameters and then getting creative with how you work within those parameters. And then I, I would also share a piece of advice that you gave me, Priya, which was, to give people roles and title those, give them titles because it allows people to um, support you in a, way, in a way that's very specific and that they take um, ownership over and 
they feel invested, really invested in contributing to the, the bigger picture. So we actually, I saw someone asked um, who managed the Zoom, um, who produced the, the, the actual like mechanics of the Zoom. Uh, they said, uh, let's see, this person is Elise Firth. Hopefully I said your last name right. I apologize if I didn't, but you said, did you hire a professional videographer to handle the Zoom logistics and camera angles? That was a challenge. What we decided to do was we, we assigned a Zoom motherboard manager, which was my sister-in-law. And she was- <laughs> Great name, great title. She was respond, we, and we literally, it was like producing a short film for the Oscar. Like it was like an Oscar, you know, an Oscar, Oscar contention in our minds. We, we, we created a shot list and we told her which, which laptop, which phone, at which moment to switch to. So it was our job to, to give her the, the, the marching orders, but it was her job in the moment to make sure that she was um, spotlighting the right device at the right moment. And guess what? It went wrong. It went wrong. My, my aisle walk down, my moment walking down the aisle was not captured. I can't even talk about it. It wasn't, I don't want to talk about it, but at least we had the plan and there was a lot that she did get right. So it's fine. You know, I will say there are, there are companies out there that will produce your Zoom event um, to perfection. So you, if you want to budget for that, there are people who will do that and execute at a high level, or you can just hire someone in your life and just train them and, and, and hope that they can execute on your behalf. Um, but I think assigning roles to people was really, really important to keeping the day running smoothly. Um, yeah. And it gives some, some people something to do. And if, again, it's, I, we said, we talked about this on the first episode of Together Apart. It was a simple example of us Passover Seder. But when you give people titles like water minister, right? This is not rocket science. It all of a sudden makes people feel not just that they have something to do, but they have a role in your community, yeah. right? So for, and then after this beautiful wedding, you went out in the street and you danced. And then there was this socially distanced block party that the rest of us, as we began to make dinner and put our own things on mute and cook, we were like, watch this like socially distanced block party for the, as the sun set and as it got dark. And it was, it was, it was awesome. So and that means we didn't dance with us, Priya? We, we danced for a little bit. And then like my carrots were burning. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, as a guest, it was this fascinating experience that was both helped, like, like really amazing to be able to zoom in in a life that is complicated right now to get to a wedding, mm -hmm. but also like almost too easy to leave, right? Mm -hmm. And so part is like, what's an exiting ritual for Zoom, right? What's a, and that's not your responsibility, but just all of these different ways to think about how do we create exit on ramps and off ramps and how do we do this? Because you're doing, we are all in new times and we're creating really fascinating moments that we all learn from each other. So mm -hmm. Elaine, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. Congratulations. Thank and um, so much love and blessings for both of you. Thank you. Now I'm off to my quarantine honeymoon. Yay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you Bye, so Elaine. much. Yeah, you're the Thank best. You. Thank you Bye, so everyone. much. And um, for those of you who can stay on for a few minutes, I'm going to invite Julie to join us. Um, is Julie on the phone? Hi, Priya. Can you hear me? Yes. How are you, Julie? I'm well, and thank you so much for this conversation. I am even more excited and inspired for our wedding day coming up in June. The creativity sparks are flying over here. Yay. So um, Julie is uh, also a bride. She and her partner are getting married in, I guess, exactly a month from yesterday. Yep. And I invited Julie to join us today because she shared with me and posted on Instagram this really a beautiful example of a ritual um, taken from her, I believe, uh, partner's lineage of marking the date a month before a wedding happens. Can you tell us what you did, what you both did? Yeah. Um, so that's exactly right, Priya. Our wedding is a month from yesterday up in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. And like Elaine, we decided to keep our date and make the most of it. Um, so we'll be celebrating with immediate family here in person and then zooming in over a hundred guests. Um, so yesterday, a month before, um, we're up at uh, my fiance's uh, family's house now. 
um, we brought that Southern tradition up North, one that we actually learned uh, about through my brother-in-laws, um, or through my brother's in-laws. Um, we grew up in Virginia and Maryland um, before his wedding last summer, and it worked perfectly for them. Uh, and the ritual is called burying the bourbon. Um, and burying so what, the bourbon. Burying the bourbon. Okay. <laughs> and so what you do, according to Southern folklore, is you buy a full bottle of bourbon, you bury it upside down as near as possible to where you actually say your vows. And for us, that's uh, in the garden. Um, and you hope for good weather, beautiful sunshine uh, on your wedding day. And in our case, as you mentioned, we also uh, were wishing for great, strong, reliable Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this example. Um, and those of you listening, again, it's weddings, but it's, it's any large occasion that means, that carries great meaning for many people, right? This is kind of in the territory that we're playing with, that there's this physical ritual of bourbon, right? So in this, all of the digital, like Zoom, this and that, the two of you, the image I have of you is the two of you with this bottle of bourbon and a shovel, <laughs> like digging into the earth. And, and part of what I loved about that is um, and I think Elaine did this well also, is as we are trying to figure out how to be together apart virtually to counterbalance so much of the digital with analog, right? With texture, with digging, with earth, with hands. Um, and, and then also the, the marking of time with this, which is, is almost like the opening salvo of your, of your wedding. Yeah. And on the day of, uh, tradition also has it that you dig up the bottle and share it with your guests. Um, so come what may, rain or shine, that's what we'll be doing. I love that. And, and perhaps the second part of the design to Elaine's point is, what's the equivalent of those who won't be, you know, won't sip from that glass? Can you invite them to bring their own bourbon, right? Yeah. Or, or whatever the equivalent might be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, I think we have time for one. And if not, I will, I will, I'll wait 30 more seconds. And Hello? See. Yes. So I was wondering if you have any ideas to manage a bilingual chat room, Spanish and English, where most people are monolingual, either or English or Spanish. It's a beautiful question. You know, I think that, um, as I said earlier with Elaine, this is a moment for invention. And I think part of what's interesting in this moment with with technology versus users is that Zoom and Google Meet and all of these, the Skype, but particularly Zoom, because it's kind of this become this ubiquitous platform were, was not created with the uses it's now being used for. And the users of Zoom are well ahead than the creators of Zoom. And so, and what I mean by that is the needs of users around the world, like bilingual chat rooms, um, could should actually lead the way and and what I would suggest is is to actually think about how to do that and then and then tell us all because this is actually how how technologies get improved um, a couple of simple uh, perhaps simple examples for that again just like DIY is if there is a if there's a gathering and you invite you give two people a title um, and it could be funny or it can be meaningful, be, you know, our, our resident UN translators, not that they're the UN, but for, they're for us, um, are going to be simultaneously on chat, have volunteered for the, for the first 30 minutes to, 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 if the chat is in English, to quickly write the chat in Spanish, right? It's like, what are the human hacks, temporary human hacks around this? And then how do we also begin to start helping the engineers at Zoom who are trying to figure out what the needs are to actually begin to bake this into the algorithms of the technologies that we are all using now. Um, so with that, I know we are coming to the hour. I want to thank you all. Um, I'm going to invite you to share uh, the podcast this week. It is on weddings. Um, you'll hear we, we work with two different couples, Elaine and Jonathan, and another couple who, uh, whose weddings were upended by Corona. And 
who both took different tactics as to whether or not, you know, to Zoom or not to Zoom. Um, one couple did create a creative Zoom wedding and the other um, decided to exchange their vows together alone and then uh, detangled the ceremony from the reception and created a very unique digital virtual set of receptions for the community um, after that date. And so we invite you to subscribe to Together Apart. Um, we invite you to share ideas for uh, and questions of your future gatherings. Um, and we are so grateful for you to join week after week. This is a lot of fun for me to hear all of your examples and questions. Um, thank you to Elaine who is off on her. She's literally, I think, driving to her honeymoon <laughs> right now um, for joining us. And this conversation is part of a slate of digital events The Times is producing to help readers navigate the world that we find ourselves in today. Uh, to find out more about the next Together Apart Live and all of our upcoming events, please visit timesevents.nytimes.com. And finally, we want to give a special thank you to all of our subscribers. You make our work possible, and we look forward to being with you again. And if those of you who are fans of the art of gathering, you know that we never end on logistics. And so what I would say to you as we close uh, is to invent new ways of coming together for the needs that you have. And on the chat, I saw a number of you have your own weddings coming up or you've already, um, you've already officiated them. But a number of you are, have people whom you love who are trying to figure this out. And we invite you to um, inspire them, to ask them what is essential for them right now. How might they redesign the certain parts of interstitching for the community in this new reality? And then to share the examples after the wedding, like Elaine did, because we all, the way we gather is contagious. And we are trying to figure out how to meaningfully still be together apart during this time, and we learn from each other. So thank you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>